Okay, great. So we have an affirmative that you can actually hear me and I'm not just talking to myself in a room, which is great. Um, yeah, thank you again so much for joining me. Cheers. Here's to mini Friday, otherwise known as Thursday, which is traditionally private view night. And I know we're all stuck indoors, but hopefully we can all sort of appreciate some art together and have a few drinks tonight. So once again, thank you so much for sharing the evening with me. Uh, so Tech Check is out of the way. As I said, this is the private view of Wild Skies, which is a collection of paintings um, centred around the theme of clouds and dramatic skies. There's much deeper meaning in there, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, I'm going to be joined by my very good friend, Reefa Thorpe Tracy. Um, so it's not just me talking to you guys, we're actually going to have a conversation as we walk around the gallery. Reefa is an incredible coach and mentor for women in the digital and creative industries and she also runs um, a hilarious media and culture review podcast called Refigure with her partner Chris TT. So she is the ideal person to ask me some questions. So um, without further ado, we are going to um, bring Reefa in. But just before I do that, I just want to give you a little overview. So we're going to chat, walk around the gallery. And then after that, um, I'm going to look through your questions in the chat box and answer some of them if I can. Cool. OK, so let's bring in Reefa. So hey, Reefa, thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah. I'm so excited to see this exhibition. I'm really proud of you and congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers, love. Cheers. Oh, there you go. I hope everyone's got a drink and can join in uh, the mini Friday celebrations. Yes, I've been going on about this for a while now, haven't I? But yeah, it's good. It's been a lot of work, but it's so nice to finally get it out to the public. So I hope people connect with it and just enjoy the space. So the actual exhibition space is live online now, so people can actually navigate around it themselves. They don't have to, um, you know, watch me trying to clumsily navigate around it. They can go and have a browse themselves while we're chatting as well. And the link is in the description below. So feel free to go and have a look around. Um, so yeah, shall we uh, have a little have a little perusal? Yeah, let's go in. But for people who don't know you, maybe you could give them a bit of background as well to your work as, and yeah. how you got started. As an artist, absolutely. Um, yes, it's been a while now. Um, I graduated from a BA illustration from Brighton University about 18 years ago now, I think, which is crazy. I mean, I'd always been a creative kid. I was an only child, so really painting and drawing was pretty much my only form of entertainment. Um, always been creative and, yeah, decided to, you know, focus on the arts and um, had three amazing years at Brighton Uni. Afterwards, I was lucky enough to have a shared desk, a desk in a shared studio space with a bunch of incredibly talented and creative um, other artists and designers who all became really good friends. And that just gave me a really good foundation for experimenting, um, trying loads of different mediums and technologies. You know, there were web designers, graphic designers, video producers, artists, street artists. So, yeah, it was a real vibrant mix so that really set me off on a really good path after uni um uh, at uni i did a dissertation on graphic activism which just blew my mind really it kind of really opened my eyes to the the power of art as a force for political change and for for social change and for good you know discovering things like the, the gorilla girls and like ad busters these were like real active um artist groups in the 80s like really trying to counteract the insane consumerism and, and like the real unbridled advertising at the time and they were doing some really really cool stuff so discovering all that really kind of blew my mind really and I think subconsciously that planted a seed in me which definitely later on grew into me becoming a sort of urban artist and street artist having found out about those those potentials for art really um, so yeah, I had a good few years um, sort of experimenting and honing my skills and starting to kind of do art out, out on the street, generally with marker pens and paste ups and sort of looking at big scale street art and just being like, oh my God, imagine one day I could do that. Maybe, who knows? And I moved to Melbourne and New Zealand and actually kind of got coerced into doing my first massive mural in Melbourne with a local street artist. And instantly I was hooked by the scale, the impact, 
the immediacy of spray, of spray paint and I was just like I just knew I wanted to do more of that so when I got back to the UK I started to sort of really see myself potentially as an urban artist and a street artist and luckily um, there was a really vibrant community of active artists in Brighton at the time who I got you know to know really well and were really supportive and I learned a lot and it was a really thriving scene back then. It was like when Banksy was first becoming a household name, let's say. And we were going up to all the different shows in London, live painting events, you know, sort of shows in squatted warehouses. It was so vibrant. It's quite raucous, not your normal classic gallery affair. These were like really, really <laughs> quite out there events. So let's, so let's go in and have a look at this new gallery space. Awesome. Okay. It's quite different your work to yeah. the street. Yes. Work. I have I've been on a bit of a journey. Um, you know, my my street artwork was mainly figurative and also my, you know, canvas based work was also figurative. And um I was also always concerned with, you know, showing quite fierce, strong women, I guess, you know, in, in my artwork and that, that might have been a kind of counteracting to the very male dominated art world that I was operating in but the, the main sort of objective it was really to kind of create emotional connection with the viewer and you know I was painting these very sort of fierce women and people instantly connected with them um, but this is a complete departure as you point and um, it sort of just happened really out of the blue I was after my dad died I was in Turks and Caicos, which is a tiny Caribbean island, visiting a friend, just, just uh, you know, decompressing after it all, and lying on the beach and drinking rum every day, and uh, watching the sky and watching the clouds, these incredible Caribbean like storm fronts just roll past me, and I just instinctually started drawing them, um, and didn't really think much of it, and then a year or so later, I was sort of was back in the UK, and I and I just realised there was there was something that I'd captured in those in those drawings of clouds, just really rough, raw sketches that I wanted to start exploring with paint. And um, so I'll just flip on to the exhibition as well, so we can actually have a look at some things. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to start exploring them in paint rather than just pencil and you know there's something so amazing about the sky it, it's very calming and it's very zen but also these storm fronts bring with them potential for chaos and calamity and you know there's just a, there's a really strong metaphor which I, I was just really really drawn to um and then sort of to think about while I was painting these clouds that hang on these aren't really just pictures of clouds I'm part of a, a tradition here you know artists have really um studied the sky and looked at the sky for inspiration throughout the centuries in art and literature you know even in myth and religion um even in literature there's something called pathetic fallacy which i'm sure people may be aware of but you know if a if a, a um a character is looking out of the window and crying quite often the sky will be gloomy or stormy to, to match their mood and i suddenly realized that actually clouds aren't just clouds for people they're a representation of human emotion you know what you see in them kind of reflects what's inside you quite often um so then I was like oh my god they're not just clouds they are they're much much more and, and they mean something different to each person but going back to my original work where I always want to create a human connection I realized that this was just another way of doing it rather than having literal figurative human representation I'm flipping it and having an abstract representation of emotion through the form of clouds. I can't wait to see them. I know there's some behind you, but... I will zoom around. And what have people's response been to these new pieces? It's been really interesting, actually. Um, I need to get back to this guy here. So these, oh, sorry, excuse me. So these three were actually exhibited at Open House. These were the first three I created. Um, and it was really interesting standing behind people, watching them, uh, watching them observe the pictures. And um, there was a husband and wife looking at, at this one, Spring Horizon. And she was like, oh, it's so tranquil. It just makes me feel so calm. And I was like, awesome. And then the husband was like, 
I don't know, looks like an atomic bomb's just gone off. And it's like these two people seeing the same painting, but just having such completely different gut reactions to it. Just, uh, it just really tickled me. Um, and then this one, The Void, um, my friend who may, who may be watching, she was just, she'd just lost a good friend of hers. And she just said that, Mish, this, this absolutely captures how I feel about losing my friend and I was like oh my god is, is that really depressing I'm really sorry she's like no no it's it's like a beautiful embodiment of all th this storm of feelings that she had and she couldn't really communicate or express to people so that to me was just like oh, I'm onto something here like this is really this is really speaking to people in a way that maybe the figurative work isn't or, or does in, in a slightly different way so this was was very very exciting for me and um i just wanted to create more and more it's fascinating isn't it because people's perception of your art when you were actually seeing that in real time absolutely but what is your process quite different say it again sorry your process yeah i've seen some of your videos on instagram which is always fascinating for people who don't oh, the time paint. lapses yes yeah yeah yeah, that's I, a bit so I guess that's, you know, that's the physical thing that, that people can observe. But before all that, there's a whole sort of um, period of visual research. And I spend a lot of time on Pinterest, <laughs> basically traveling the world without leaving my lounge room. Um, I'm a complete travel nut and I really, you know, I miss not being able to travel. So exploring Pinterest when you're looking for epic, natural photography and you know big storm fronts I mean the, the images you can find are just incredible so I spent hours pouring through loads and loads of visual reference looking for like the perfect composition of clouds the perfect drama the perfect amount of depth um, and then once I select you know the good ones I'll then take them to photoshop and do a whole sort of series of kind of image manipulation I'll flip them I'll steal bits from lots of different images sometimes to create you know, a completely original composition, or I'll skew and morph things and colour tint them, because I'm really I'm not interested in capturing real colour. I'm interested in <laughs> in expressing quite an insane colour palette because I just think colour is such a powerful force for like lifting your mood and changing you know the space that a painting is in. Um, so that's that's all the things I'm thinking about before I even mm -hmm. start drawing or painting. And then, yes, you know, if, if you want to find out more, absolutely, you can check out the ink time lapses that I've done. The ink work is very fluid and loose, um, whereas the oil paintings such as. Um, sorry, one moment, I'll scroll out. I mean, it's so fascinating for people who don't paint and for painters as well, just to see how. Yeah make these beautiful pieces of art so this What's this is this is an ink oh. drawing here so an ink painting whereas these these three are oil paintings and the process is very very different with oil paint it's you know it's quite like working with soft butter or kind of hard-ish mm -hmm. butter and you can mix in mediums to try and create you know get it a bit looser but it's it's a very kind of methodical quite a slow process and there's drying times to think about and lots of layers you have to layer it up um, but me being me and wanting to sort of remain true to my uh, street art roots, I do also throw in bits of spray paint here and there. Um, going back to um, these guys here. Yeah. These are, you know, it's quite delicate oil painting, but then with these just really, really bold geometric um stripes of of spray paint um, and the spray paint brings in a real element of unpredictability and texture that I can't really get with the oil paint so I really love mm. combining mediums it, it excites me a lot <laughs> that's brilliant that is so interesting um what about your influences who's influenced you do you think oh my god I mean in oh. terms of contemporary artists probably too many to mention but always for me a massive love is um Japanese art mm. but specifically the floating world kind of paintings and woodcuts of like the 17th to 19th century I think everyone is probably familiar with you know um the great wave that's probably one of the most 
familiar ones of them, but there's, there was hundreds and thousands produced and they are just so stunning in terms of composition, negative space, um, and also like the symbolism within them. Quite often they're about, mm -hmm. you know, sort of mankind's connection to nature, um, sort of tranquility, inner turmoil. You know, there's, there's so much symbolism in them that it's incredible. Like mountains mean one thing, clouds mean another thing, waves mean something else. So just everything about that has always just been a massive influence for me, for all my art, even for my sort of street art. And you know, for, for me, I can see the Japanese influence in something like this piece here. Whether other people can, I, I don't know, but that's that's always been a major influence for me. And then specific, for these kind of, um, you know, let's, let, they are quite dramatic, these cloudscapes. I, I can also see influence from like the old masters, like Turner. And, yeah, yeah. Um, more obscurely, there's this insane artist, 18th, 19th century, John Martin, who's like a catastrophe painter. If you haven't seen his work, check it out. It's bonkers. It's, um, you know, at the time, every, everyone was doing religious paintings. Let's call them religious paintings. But really, his work is just like massive maelstroms above, you know, these insane landscapes. And it's supposed to, with, with like cracks of lighting, lightning, which is supposed to be the hand of God. But there is no God in these paintings. They are pure, raw forces of nature. It's insane. There's one painting where it's like a scene out of inception where a whole city is like folding in on itself. And the colours are out of this world. So like he yeah he's like okay it's okay to paint mental stuff like this great <laughs> thanks John Martin <laughs> so yeah I mean but in terms of influences there's a lot to mention but those two kind of you know stand out and what's really interesting with his work he was so popular and he was painting at the time of the industrial revolution which was gen genuinely perceived at the time to be a complete and utter like apocalypse people thought it was the end of days and subsequently, these are like really dramatic paintings, like people couldn't get enough of them. It's, it's very interesting. And so to bring you to like 2020, how has the lockdown and the pandemic affected your work and, yeah. and how you're coping? Well, I think in, the effect was twofold in the sense that it free, you know, it gave me a lot more time than I would have normally had to focus on my art. And for that, I was hugely grateful. Um, but equally, you know, what was going on? Sorry, I'm just going to zoom out. And um, go over here again. Um, what was going on? You, you couldn't really ignore it, you know, if, it, <sighs> such a state of shock that everybody was in. And for me, painting was a way of really, really channeling that kind of fear, that uncertainty, that, oh my fucking God, how, how are we in this situation? It's been so badly handled. Just so many emotions going on that were going into these paintings. Um, you know, and we, we experienced it very firsthand, like my partner got really, really ill and is, is still experiencing issues um, with long COVID. And yeah, the whole time during lockdown, it was always just playing in the back of my mind that we, we were going through an un, unprecedented time. And um, these paintings were definitely my way of of channeling like all my ah, freakouts into this work, but it, hopefully in a positive way. Um, this painting, for example, uh, sorry, I'm getting lost in my own gallery. Um, the Eternal Optimist really kind of sums it up. You know, it's dark, it's brooding, but there's there's always light. There's always you know, there's always hopefully a ray of hope. And that, I mean, I am quite an optimistic, upbeat person, so I think this kind of embodies the exhibition in a way. And uh, yeah, this was a joy to paint. It it was one of those paintings that almost just painted itself. I didn't mm. really need to think about it. It it just happened oh. in about two sittings, and it it was just suddenly done. So that, that's and you, were, you were in the flow for that. Yeah, it's a real treat. That doesn't happen very often, but it obviously wanted to be born. <laughs> so there it is. Do you think that that creativity and painting for you affects your mental health? Like, if you're not able to paint for any reason, or if you haven't painted for a while, does it affect you? Or I think if I don't paint, I get this real sense of 
um, that I'm kind of not not living up to my full potential, you know, like, because there, there was, there was a period of a, probably about a year and a half where I didn't create any work at all. I'd had a complete crisis of confidence. And there was just this niggling thing in the back of me, every waking minute, pretty much, of like, why aren't you, why aren't you painting? What are you doing? What are you doing? So it took a long time and a lot of um, soul searching and research and realizing where I needed support to get back into painting. And now, absolutely, it's, I would say, totally vital to me having a good you know a good sort of outlook and being yeah mentally healthy for sure and I'd say that for everybody as well mm. you know even if you don't see yourself as an artist drawing even even just drawing sketching doodling it's just so so, so good for you definitely definitely I really agree with that and I also think colour is so important isn't it I mean we're both rocking our red today and uh and it just makes makes me feel more confident. Like they do say, red makes you feel more confident and more. Oh, like, that's interesting. I didn't know that in terms of wearing energizing. red. Yeah, energizing. Um, do you find that? Do you find certain colors more uplifting than others? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could probably see a thread in my work of the love of neon orange, <laughs> um, but also importantly, contrasting colors is is what is what creates the drama and tension in a piece like if something is all orange and red you know that's got a very certain vibe but if you're contrasting your colors like with um neon dawn here so you know blue and orange are complementary colors so they instantly have a kind of tension and a zing and it, as much as it's not very subtle i really love harnessing that that conversation between colors to create this like palpable energy in a painting so yeah I can't really get enough of it <laughs> like I'm addicted to bright bright colours whether I will always be I don't know but I am certainly at the moment so thank you so much for showing us around your exhibition what is next what's your what's your dream project or your big goal oh my god it's a good question it's a really good question I have multiple let's say and it's always a it's always a gamble to which one you know comes good but certainly I want to take this approach and render it on a massive scale so I want to do huge murals of, of these kinds of paintings um, so I'm on the hunt for big walls so if anyone knows um, I also want to you know going back to the traditional approach actually start painting au plein air which is outdoors in French and mm -hmm. that is a whole discipline in itself you know it's, it's like adventure painting and you know that really appeals to me I, I'm we, we ride dirt bikes and we're out in the countryside quite a lot in the summer so I want to construct something that I can attach to my dirt bike and maybe go and find some awesome locations to paint in um, and then start the next collection which I think we'll be possibly bringing back some figurative elements into the paintings in a fragmented way. So I'm really, really excited to start experimenting with that once this show is, is done. Amazing. I think you're such a talent. I'm so proud to be your friend and point out all your street art around Brighton. <laughs> yeah, you're my super fan, aren't you? <laughs> I just love it. I think it's a real, real talent and you're amazing. So thanks so much for showing me around the exhibition. Oh, well, thank you for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so we'll end this now and then I'm going to hop back and chat to everybody um, on uh, live chat. So yeah, thank you so much for joining me, Rifa, and um, we'll speak to you soon. Bye. Oh, and that was lovely Rifa. And now she's gone. Okay, nice to have nice to be back with you. Um, thanks for all your lovely comments. Um, I've got a couple of questions here, so I'm going to answer those. Um, one or two, in fact, from Kate Bullpit. Hiya, Kate. How are you doing? Um, so during these very topsy-turvy times, and particularly during lockdown, what have you found most inspiring for continuing to create art? Um, Good question. It's for me, like I think I touched on it before, um, the crisis of confidence was a real issue. So for me, inspiration wasn't the problem. It was having the confidence to execute the ideas. So that meant doing some research into what I could do to support myself um, and 
basically finding structures and methods and processes to use in my work. Because otherwise it's just chaos, right? You've got sketchbooks, you've got all these ideas swimming around your head. How do you whittle them down? And it's actually, it sounds quite boring, but it's about finding a process and a framework to work within that allows you to get a single idea and follow it through to completion. Otherwise you're just paralyzed by too many ideas, if that makes sense. Um, and the second question from Kate, does creating your paintings make you feel more hopeful or joyful about the world? Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like therapy while you're painting, you're sort of thinking, thinking through things. And, you know, we live in a world where art exists, which is an, an incredible thing. It's such an ancient, primal part of humans that really everybody, if they could tap into their creative hearts, I think the world would be a much better place. So by simply you know, creating and painting, I sort of feel like I'm, I'm kind of giving back to the world in a way, um, which definitely makes me feel better about things. Um, and your third question, what's the most amazing experience you've had relating to your art and or someone else's? Hmm. I mean, painting on the street is always incredible. Like the reaction from people, you know, and like all walks of life, you know, all walks of life just stop and they want to talk to you. They want to know what it's about. They quite often want to know if they can have a go as well. Um, so that's one of the things why I love sort of painting on the street so much. Um, and it just really touches people and makes it accessible. You know, normally art is tucked away in a gallery or in someone's room. Um, but by painting on the street, it it democratizes, democratizes it. it. It makes it available to everybody. So I've had some like countless amazing moments while painting on the street um, in that respect. And then again, from the emotional connect connection perspective, like um, uh, someone bought a print recently of um, one of my geisha women and just, you know, the message she sent after she was at home, the piece was on the wall, she was doing yoga in front of it. And she said like, it is giving me power. It's giving me magic. And like, you, you can't, ask for a better better feedback than that really so it's just these little little messages from people that have bought my work I think that's just you know that's amazing amazing experiences um so if you've got any other questions pop them in um, La Luna I love your use of gold leaf and your time lapse videos of you using it is it difficult to work with and what inspired you to use it also there isn't a red dot next to the one I've bought. It's all right, darling, there is on the website. Um, yeah, the gold leaf. I mean, why wouldn't you use it? It's like you're an alchemist. You know, suddenly you can turn your paintings into these shimmering, you know, adds a three-dimensional perspective. And I don't know, it just feels like magic while you're doing it. The process is very, very particular and quite time consuming. But once you brush off all the excess and it's worked, that's a treat. So it's that real kind of gratifying um, process and, and it's gold we all I don't know humans love gold <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about it but yeah the alchemy side of it really appealed to me and a friend um sent me a poem about an alchemist and he sent it to me because my artwork reminded him of it which I just thought was brilliant so yeah that's why I started using gold leaf um one moment Oh, and I'm getting some questions on, on, the, on the, uh, the old phone. Um, so one sec, uh, just wanted to ask whether you had added any gold leaf into those paintings. Yes, yes, Carly, there is, there's gold leaf. Oh, this is a one drawback of the um, the 3D spaces. You don't quite get to see them in, um, yeah, so it's locked away. Oh, actually I have, I have got one. This is the one that Jolie has just purchased. As you move around the room, it, it just catches catches the light in a really, really magical way. I hope that's giving you a little, a little hint. Okay, so sorry, going back to the chat box. Um, Gray, hey Gray. Oh my God, check out Gray's work. He is like on another level. Joe Simpson, phenomenal artist. Oh my God. Yeah, wow. Um, do you still see yourself combining your creative and your style in the future? 
future, again, the travel, absolutely, yes, for sure. Um, I've got notions of kind of Sorry, my beautiful assistant is informing me that you can't hear me. Um, yes, I'm absolutely combining uh, figurative elements with the clouds. I think in a really sort of um, fragmented, deconstructed way. That's my plan. We'll see how it turns out. But yes, I'll, I'll um, keep everyone updated on Instagram of my processes. And uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Starting a new collection is a daunting thing. So I'll keep you posted. <laughs> uh, Hugh, hey Hugh. Um, oh, it's Luca. Hi Luca. Uh, what is your favourite piece from the collection and why? Oh my God, that's such a tough one. Um, right, so let's see if I can hop back into the exhibition space. Favourite piece? Oh, I can never answer these questions. Um, I... Uh, hmm. <laughs> I still think as much as I, I don't know, there's just something about the way that the eternal optimist turned out and the process of painting it was, was so uh, different for me than all the others that it's like, it's got a special place in my heart because of the process more. And also the composition, it's very long and thin. It feels like a very Japanese composition. Um, very atypical, and I like it for that reason as well. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed three favourites, but I'm going to say... Um, and then these three, I just really enjoy the, the mixing. It's almost pop art meets kind of psychedelic oil painting, and I, I love it when things cross over and there's a fusion. Um, so I think possibly those three as well. <laughs> I'm basically just going to talk about all the paintings, so I'll stop there, but I hope that answers your question in some way, Luca. Um, oh, is my sound back now? I hope, I'm hoping people can hear me. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to camera again. Um, I had another question from um, Sue uh, before before tonight and she was actually asking about the, the platform that I've used to build the exhibition and it's um it's called Kunst Matrix so Kunst as in German for art and uh yeah really amazing quite simple to use platform so if there's any artists watching and you want to do a similar thing I'm happy to kind of share I mean really it's it's very easy to use to so just sign up for free and then once you want to publish you can just um subscribe but I'm happy to kind of share how, how I did things if anyone's interested and so let's see if, okay, hey Chris, uh, how is it putting together the virtual show compared to the physical exhibition? Um, yes, a million times easier <laughs> and cheaper. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's incredible, you know, in terms of curating a space, it's so easy to just move things around, do multiple different layouts and see which works, um, change rooms, change wall colours at the flick of a button. I mean, really radically simplifying the process. Obviously, you don't get a physical private view, but we couldn't do that anyway. So really, for, for situations like this, it's, it's perfect. And I think the art world as a whole has really embraced this during pandemic. Like you look at the big London galleries, they all now have online 3D virtual viewing rooms and they're stunning. You know, this is a fairly simplistic um, solution but there are really really high end like you could barely tell the difference between reality um so i think this this is the future for the art world um it, there'll be virtual art fairs everything yeah it's, it's really exciting um so i hope that answered your question um and so another question from kate is it sometimes hard to sell your paintings in that they're apart from you Oh, is he, or does it just make you happy? Yeah, it sounds like there's this little moment of like, oh, got it, I really wanted to keep them. <laughs> but you can't keep them all because I live in a tiny flat. Where would I put them? <laughs> so yeah, there's absolutely like, it, it is a part of you, but also you are creating these things for other people to enjoy as well. So I just like the fact that they're out there on other people's walls. And when people send me pictures of them in situ, I love that as well. 
Um, okay, so let's see if there's another question. Uh, okay, can't access the link. Um, I will put it up online afterwards. So apologies for that. If it says you can't access it, that's strange. Tech issue. I'll, I'll send it out after. Um, okay, so I think that's all for questions. Um, in terms of going forward, the, the virtual space is um, open for a month for you to explore um, when you get the correct link. <laughs> And there will also be, as of next week, an augmented reality feature as well, which al will allow you to um, download and print a QR code for each painting. And then you can put that QR code on your wall. And then using your phone, you can view what a painting would look like on your wall. So that if anyone's wondering, oh, I don't know if it will look good in my house or if the size will work, that will be a really, really useful feature. Um, so I will let everybody know when that is live as um, early next week hopefully and um, yeah I think that's everything well thank you so much for joining me everybody it really really means the world to me that you've chosen to spend you know this time with me and um, if you've got any questions after the show then um, just email me there's a contact form on my website mishfit.com and um, yeah happy to carry on the conversation but for now, thank you so much. Um, have a final toast. Thanks again to Reefa for being a wonderful companion. And um, I'll see you all soon. Lots of love. Bye.